Good afternoon. Thank you for joining me for this episode of Malware Analysis Fundamentals. Today we're going to be taking a look at uh, a slightly shorter video, I think. Um, today we're going to be covering uh, strings, which is a pretty basic malware analysis technique that allows us to uh, extract some things that perhaps the adversary has specified within their program when writing it um, that could give us hints towards things like persistence mechanisms, um, files that they're going to be looking for, files they may be creating, as well as domains that they may be reaching out to for C2 and all kinds of good information. It's a very low effort way to extract good indicators of compromise or indicators of attack uh, from a binary. So without further ado, we'll go ahead and get started. You can see I've got two samples here on my desktop today. Um, we'll take a look at each of these separately. Um, so the first example is probably my favorite way to demonstrate the sheer power of the strings utility um, and what you can obtain from various samples with it. So what we'll do is we'll just run strings on that first. So our sample is starting with 24D and what we'll do is we'll just use a little uh, greater than sign here and we'll just send that to uh, strings.text. As you can see it runs very rapidly. Um, it's not a particularly uh, resource intensive tool. All it does is pull out ASCII and Unicode strings from the binary that have been specified by the uh, adversary as they wrote their program. So now we can open that up in Notepad++ and review some of the strings that we've got. So you can see that there's a lot of sort of useless information here. They're very small strings. Uh, so, and we've also got quite a large file here, which makes it fairly difficult to parse through this. So what we'll do is we'll actually just close this out. And we can use switches within uh, strings to specify that we only want strings of a certain length. It's usually pretty likely that if you're looking for strings, um, if the adversary has specified them or written them statically into their code, um, they're going to be of a significant length, say, five or six characters. So for this instance, we'll go for minus n six, and that's only going to return strings that it finds specified that are at least six characters in length. So we'll go ahead and run that and just overwrite our previous file. All right, so opening that up with Notepad++ uh, shows us a little bit more parsable, readable information here. So we'll just keep scrolling through here and see if we can find anything uh, of note. So starting at the top, we can see the uh, DOS header here. Um, that's fairly normal. Uh, we see a few section names. Keep scrolling down, we can see some uh, Windows API uh, calls here. So things like uh, terminate thread, uh, get tick count, that could be an anti-debug measure there that we might want to look out for. Um, get module handle W, exit process, um, fairly normal API calls that you would expect to see specified as strings. Keep scrolling down, uh, you see another DOS header, uh, which is interesting, we may have just appended to this file. Uh, keep going though. Okay, so some more API calls that look uh, different something that says play game which is interesting I don't think there's any game to be played in this keep scrolling down okay so we've got taskske.exe so it looks like it may be a reference to task scheduler um, or perhaps uh, something that it uses Microsoft Security Center 2.0 service not familiar with that that's very suspicious and perhaps an indicator of attack or compromise Mm -hmm. And very interesting here. It looks like we've got a full domain here specified. So let's copy that. We'll come back to that shortly. We've got a third DOS header here. It may be that this program includes several, several embedded executables uh, that it's going to drop to disk. So it may be holding several of those binaries within itself and uh, then extracting those at a later time uh, for a persistence mechanism, uh, lateral movement exploit attempts, 
uh, or things like that. It could be something like PS Exec. Uh, it could write that to disk. It could be bringing its own copy of PowerShell and, and writing that. Those are all uh, valid techniques that we see in the wild, but we can certainly see that there appears to be more than one binary here. Scrolling on through, I'm not seeing a whole lot more interesting uh, within the strings here, except for these right here, dot WNRY. Now, several of you may be familiar with that file extension. Uh, it was fairly famous several years ago. Um, and if you just keep scrolling down, you're gonna see more and more of these. So this is a sample for the WannaCry uh, family of malware that was uh, prolific several years ago. And the domain that we found, if you actually do uh, a Google search for that domain, you'll find this. Uh, this is the domain that was discovered and sinkholed uh, that uh, basically acted as a kill switch for the WannaCry uh, strain of malware. So as you can see, the strings utility is incredibly valuable. Uh, simply running strings across a sample of WannaCry uh, revealed a domain that acted as a kill switch. So um, perhaps an oversight by the adversary in this case, however, uh, very, very useful. Um, it stopped uh, the attack dead in its tracks just by being able to run the strings utility across it. I feel like this example really demonstrates uh, the power and flexibility of being able to just extract those ASCII and Unicode strings uh, from the malware with such a simple tool. Another thing that we can consider is that getting these API calls just with strings um, is fairly easy to do programmatically. It's something that could be done um, utilizing a simple Python script. Um, you could also do this uh, using some sort of PE parser, um, but just looking at strings very quickly, even within the terminal, uh, may give you a good idea of what APIs the malware calls and what functionality it has as a result. So if we look at some of these API calls, we can see things like uh, create service A. Um, so we may know that this malware creates a service as a persistence mechanism. Spoiler alert, it does. Um, MSSEC service is a well-known uh, indicator of compromise uh, associated with the WannaCry malware. So you can also see things like internet open URL A, probably referencing the sinkhole domain that we saw previously. Um, crypt gen random, so you can see it uh, creating uh, a cryptographic key there, so you can uh, assume with fairly good accuracy that it's going to encrypt everything on your disk and make you have a very bad day. Um, get tick count, as I previously referenced, that may be an anti-debug measure, so the way that get tick count works is it checks um, basically how long it's been executing, so uh, if I'm single stepping through the code, obviously it's going to take quite a bit longer, so more ticks, and if it hits a certain number of ticks, then it may call you know an exit process or something like that. Um, that can be a little tricky to defeat unless you just want to knock that out. Um, looks like there was some mutex stuff in here as well. Uh, create process A, so it may uh, create uh, child processes, which it's probably going to do. You can see msexservice.exe, uh, which is a well-known IOC, again, for WannaCry. Um, that is not a legitimate Windows file name. Keep scrolling down. Um, if you look down here, we've got uh, some other interesting stuff, probably just remnants, but then we've got more API calls like is debugger present, um, which again is a, a, a possible anti-debug measure. Uh, just simply checking that if a debugger is attached to the process, um, we can just go ahead and call something like exit process or terminate process. Um, so as you can see, it's not just good for finding domains and IOCs. It can also give you a, a fairly quick idea of what capabilities this malware uh, may actually have. Um, again, you could do this a little bit uh, better uh, with a PE parser of some kind, like PE Studio, or even looking at API imports in Ghidra or Ida, something like that. Um, but this is a very quick way to go about it. So for our next example, I have another sample that I have run the strings utility across. Uh, again, specifying that we only want to look at strings that are at least six characters in length. Um, and then I've opened that in Notepad++ for us. If you look, uh, we've got far fewer strings here. You can see the scroll bar is a much different size, uh, and we don't have a whole great deal to go through. And a lot of it still looks to be uh, some sort of basically useless gibberish. Uh, we do have uh, a few executable files specified here, things like mysqld.exe, 
um, Thunderbird config, Firefix, Firefox config.exe, uh, Steam, WinWord, WordPad. Uh, we've also got uh, a heart emoji and someone's name, Fabian, uh, as well as uh, some commands with uh, string uh, placeholder specified here, percent %s. Some content type stuff, uh, and then pub key, proof key. Uh, so that's going to be a little interesting, I think. Uh, cryptographic provider v1.0, um, and then some some directories here, uh, as well as uh, <laughs> just outright saying ransomware uh, is a string that's specified in here. So spoiler alert, uh, that may be what we're looking at. Um, keep scrolling down. Um, you've got some uh, API calls in here. Uh, you got some malware hunter, gand crab, gand crab, uh, just a very long domain here. I'm not even going to attempt to pronounce whatever that is. Um, a few API calls like close handle, uh, wait for single object, get tick count, might possibly be an anti-debug measure there. Um, keep scrolling, we've got uh, just all kinds of stuff like crypt gen key, crypt encrypt, which is fairly standard and what you would expect for, for a piece of malware such as this. Some HTTP send request W stuff. Um, and then just a whole bunch more gibberish. Now, when I see something like this, I often think this can't be everything, right? So a common technique that um, malware authors will use is if there are strings um, that they want to be able to put into their program that they need, uh, be it to call a specific API, but they want to do it in a roundabout way so it's a little less obvious that they're utilizing that API, or if, um, I don't know, it's something that they want to hide from a malware analyst such as yourself, they will use a technique called stack strings. Um, so stack strings are when you take each character, right, and you assign it to a specific variable or uh, an array even, and you load each one of those onto the stack, that is to say memory, separately. So what you can do is you can slowly iterate and build a string from many different variables. So it won't be a static string like you would be able to extract with strings, but it will be a string of various variables that when all mashed together make sense, but separately just look like a single character. Uh, so thankfully there are tools for that. Um, a really good one is Floss by uh, the folks at FireEye. So what we'll do is I'll just go ahead and get Floss running. Um, so we're just gonna say Floss and then our sample and we'll do stack strings dot text and uh, floss does take a while to decrypt and run the uh, obfuscated strings within uh, a piece of malware so we'll just let this run for a second and then we'll come back and do a side-by-side -side comparison of what we got with strings and what we got with floss and we'll see how those differ okay so floss has completed and uh, I've opened both of them side by side in Notepad++. Uh, you can see just by looking that we've got uh, more than double the lines that we uh, extracted with strings just because Floss is uh, more attuned to this uh, specific task and it's basically designed to do exactly this. So it's gonna come up with uh, a few more results than you would see from um, just strings. However, I do want to draw your attention to specifically uh, the last portion of the file here. So if you look at the bottom, uh, you can see things that we did not see uh, in our standard strings calls. So if you look here, uh, you can see that we've got uh, crabdecrypt.txt. That's probably going to be the uh, .txt file uh, that is dropped to the desktop after all of your files are encrypted. That's probably a good indicator of compromise, although perhaps a little too late if that's what you're detecting. Um, you can also see uh, what is my IP address.com, so it may be looking uh, to see where it's at uh, in the world or who it's infected, uh, correlating that with an ASN or something like that. Um, you can also see uh, references to Itanium. Uh, I'm not sure what they would be doing with that, but it's certainly interesting. Um, you can also see things like ekern.exe, which is going to be uh, an antivirus binary, um, as well as several other antivirus binaries here. Um, Curiously, it doesn't look like CrowdStrike Falcon is in there. Uh, may explain why uh, GanCrab isn't around anymore. Uh, keep scrolling down. Uh, yeah, you got things like MSMPNG, 
uh, .exe, that's just Windows Defender. Um, looks like some encoded strings, which are just gan crab gan crab gan crab gan crab over and over and over again. Interesting. Um, looks like uh, Polidia Romana .bit. I imagine that is uh, probably a C2 server, uh, perhaps a uh, compromised website that is being used to distribute malware or um, just some of their own infrastructure. You've also got GANCRAB, exclamation point, as well as cliff.sys, that may be uh, a driver that's loaded. Um, I don't know if GANCRAB utilizes that as a persistence mechanism or not. Um, looks like we've also got uh, shadow copy delete, so uh, pretty good indication there that you're going to be seeing some uh, shadow copy deletion in order to inhibit system recovery. Um, you can see that again here, VSS admin delete shadows all quiet, pretty standard ransomware operations. Um, lots of uh, sys files, those may be either um, drivers that they load for persistence or they could just be um, drivers that are loaded by kernel mode um, antivirus products that they're looking for and would like to avoid. You can also see uh, a run key here, so that's probably going to be a persistence mechanism. Looks like we've got a request here where the host is going to be bitdefender.com, so we may expect to see uh, some traffic outbound for that domain. I'm not sure what they would be doing there, but it's certainly interesting and something that we can take and plug into perhaps some dynamic analysis techniques later on. Also got uh, cryptogen random, uh, as well as a, a Tor project to downloader. Um, pretty standard for uh, ransomware actors to require use of uh, tour in order to pay your um, ransom. You've also got uh, this one here, which is Windows System 32 WBEM WMIC. Um, very interesting. So WMI, Windows Management Instrument, uh, Windows Management Instrumentation, uh, can be utilized to move laterally within a network and is often utilized uh, to either move laterally within a network, uh, check out um, what antivirus you may be running or create persistence mechanisms through what's called a WMI subscription. Um, so all of those uh, are something that, you know, you may be uh, interested in knowing that they're aware of or utilizing. Um, and this was all decoded uh, just from using floss to pull out uh, strings that were stored on the stack and were not uh, standard ASCII or Unicode strings. Okay, so just a quick recap of what we've done here today. We looked at two examples of ransomware, including uh, WannaCry and GANCRAB, and then ran two different tools. Uh, first, strings, which can extract uh, ASCII and Unicode static strings, and then FLOSS, which can also do that, but has the added ability of pulling out stack strings, that is to say, strings that are split up and stored on the stack as separate characters and then combined so that they make sense. We looked at both the malware samples uh, and WannaCry. We pulled out the uh, kill switch domain, which stopped WannaCry from encrypting computers. And then we also uh, looked at GANCRAB and were able to pull out uh, various different techniques that the malware may use, utilizing FLOSS, including things like WMI, domains that it may call, as well as the name of the malware itself. So we were able to attribute a previously unknown sample simply through the utilization of uh, pulling out stack strings and uh, static ASCII and Unicode strings. These are very simple tools. Uh, however, they're very useful to get a high level overview of the capabilities of the malware, as well as some indicators of compromise that we can look for in our networks, like domains that it may call, commands that it may run, like uh, deleting shadow copies, or things of that nature. I hope today's video was useful for you and, and makes you a more effective malware analyst. Stick around because I'm also going to be posting a Crack Me example this week. And then I'll see you again next week where we'll take a look at some dynamic analysis stuff uh, so that we can put some of what we've learned through our static analysis to the test and validate our findings. Thanks.